Tecfidera is one of the most popular drugs to treat MS, but how good is it in the real world? We'll take a look at this observational study that followed people over many years and see how effective it is and what are the side effects citations below. As an overview, Tecfidera is simply dimethylfumarate, this simple small molecule you may have heard of fumarate, an intermediary of the Krebs cycle or tricarboxylic acid cycle in the cell. You learned about it in high school biology. People were surprised when such a simple molecule was proven to be effective in MS and it was FDA approved in 2013 when I was a fellow training in multiple sclerosis. Typically, there's an introductory dose given, 120 milligrams twice daily because it can cause some side effects like flushing of the skin or a hot flash sensation or gastrointestinal side effects like diarrhea, but it's often well tolerated. It can also lower the white blood cells in some cases. It's metabolized to monomethylfumarate, which is the active metabolite. It's not exactly known how this drug works. It does have effects on the lymphocytes, the T and B cells known to be involved in the pathogenesis of MS, but also has a secondary effect where it activates a transcription factor, NRF2. This modifies the way DNA is expressed or transcribed into messenger RNA, and NRF2 is known to be involved in oxidative stress, so this could act as an antioxidant protecting the cell. We'll take a quick look at some of the older studies showing the efficacy of the drug. This is the DEFINE trial, Tecfidera versus placebo in relapsing MS. They looked at the annualized relapse rate or the number of attacks or relapses per person per year. It was 0.22 with Tecfidera and 0.4 with placebo, a 44% reduction, moderately effective but not a blockbuster. It also reduced disability. This is confirmed disability progression, meaning that some someone worsens and it isn't just day-to-day -day fluctuation because a follow-up examination shows that the participant in the study is still worse and disability progression was 16.4% with Tecfidera versus 27.1% with placebo, a 39.5% relative reduction, not bad. And I previously did an analysis looking at the efficacy of different disease modifying therapies and I ranked Tecfidera roughly in the middle. So now let's take a look at the study in question, the ESTEEM trial. Now this is not a randomized trial, it's just an observational study, but it can answer some questions a randomized trial can't answer. One, how does the drug perform long term? How effective is it over many years, not just in a brief randomized trial? Two, are there any new side effects we didn't see in a smaller sample size, now that we have a bigger sample size? And three, how does it perform in the real world? People who enter clinical trials tend to have certain characteristics and they may be different than the general population of people with MS who are actually going to receive this drug. So they looked at people who were newly prescribed Tecfidera, they hadn't been on it yet, and it was 393 different sites all throughout the world, 5,124 participants, 74% of which were female, matching the overall demographics of multiple sclerosis. The mean age at enrollment was 40 years. Keep in mind the average age of diagnosis of MS is around 30, and this is a drug for relapsing MS, so 98.9% .9 had this form of MS, and they had 6.5 years of follow-up, much longer than the randomized trials, though the mean duration of actual Tecfidera treatment was 31 months, less than three years, because many people change medication, so only some of these people got it for six years. First, we'll look at effectiveness. And by the way, that term refers to how effective a drug is in an observational study, whereas efficacy refers to how effective a drug is in a randomized trial. And we're looking at relapse rate, annualized relapse rate, relapses per person per year. In the 12 months prior to entering the study on the left, it was 0.82, a little less than one relapse per person on average. And you can see it went dramatically down to 0.15, then 0.11, then 0.10. Now there's a bias here because often people have a relapse right before starting a new drug or right after they get diagnosed with multiple sclerosis. So even placebo would be associated with a dramatic drop, but these numbers are fairly low, a 90% drop. And 0.1 after three years, for instance, refers to an average of one relapse over 10 patients. If 10 different people started the drug over a one year period, only one of them would have a single relapse in a given year, not too shabby, and this is sustained over many years. The drug doesn't lose 
effectiveness. The body doesn't seem to get used to it. It remains moderately effective throughout its entire use. Here we're looking at disability progression. Again, this is confirmed disability progression, which means that someone has objectively measured worsening disability. And on a follow-up exam, they have not yet improved. So it wasn't just measurement error or random fluctuation. And this is freedom from disability progression. So at the beginning, everyone is free from progression of disability, but over time, some people have progression. But after four years, 84.9% were still free of disability progression. And even after five years, 82.3%, the clear majority, were free of disability progression. Now, keep in mind that some people don't follow up. Some people monitoring patients may not actually measure disability. And so it may underestimate the true rate of disability progression. Obviously, over five years, this is comparable to what was reported in the randomized trial after about two years. So it's a little bit difficult to believe, but there are relatively low rates of disability progression even after five years. They also looked at patient reported outcomes. These are subjective surveys. There's some aspects of MS that can't be measured, such as fatigue. MFIS is the modified fatigue impact scale. They looked at reported quality of life. And you look at the numbers. These are changed from baseline. They were very small compared to the individual standard deviation. So people were mostly stable in terms of patient reported outcomes. They weren't really getting worse over the course of the study. The same was true for work performance. They looked at number of missed days and work impairment, and people were basically stable over the course of the study. Increased sick days can be a subtle sign of increasing multiple sclerosis symptoms, but people were basically stable. Let's shift over to the side effects of Tecfidera. These are adverse events or side effects that led people to stop taking the drug. So overall, there are 5,124 people, and 1,237, a lot of them, 24%, stopped taking this due to side effects. Now, they didn't group these together well. The most common side effect was some kind of gastrointestinal side effect. So diarrhea, nausea, upper abdominal pain, abdominal pain, vomiting, abdominal discomfort, that as a group was by far the most common side effect. Many people get flushing. You may think I'm crazy, but I've actually taken a single tablet of this medication and I had very severe flushing. It can be significant and some people stop taking it for this reason. It helps to take it with a large meal and sometimes people take aspirin to reduce the flushing. The more serious concern would be lymphopenia or low lymphocytes, a subclass of white blood cells, which occurred in 4% or 194 people, more on that later. And people do stop this drug very frequently. So about half, 51%, stop Tecfidera at some point. And a lot of them stop due to some kind of side effect, mostly non-serious side effects that would resolve after stopping the drug, but it is very common. But 566, or 11%, stop due to poor efficacy of the treatment, presumably either relapses or new MRI lesions. So even though relapses weren't that common, they do lead to people quitting the treatment. Let's go back to lymphopenia. This is a lymphocyte, a B or a T cell. They can be low in some people taking this drug, and that could be potentially linked to infections. Now, not everyone had their lymphocytes checked. Only 62% had at least one blood test after the baseline, possibly because some of them stopped taking the drug right away due to the side effects, but it is recommended to check this periodically. Low lymphocytes were common. In 10.3%, there was a count between 0.2 and 0.5. That's fairly low, called grade 3 lymphopenia. And for a very small number, 29 or 0.9%, it was less than 0.2. That's very, very low. Grade 4 lymphopenia, but rare, less than 1%. And 4% of people stopped the treatment for this reason. However, in this particular study, according to the article, there was, quote, no correlation between prolonged moderate to severe lymphopenia with an increased incidence of infections. Now, I'm a bit skeptical of this. Previously, it's been reported, for instance, PML, the rare brain infection caused by the JC virus, mostly associated with the MS drug Tysabri, but rarely reported with Tecfidera, has been linked to lymphopenia. But they didn't find any clear association in this study, maybe because a lot of people with severe lymphopenia lymphopenia just stopped the drug and their lymphocytes went back up. They found the rate of serious infections was 2.6% 
for those with lymphocyte counts less than 0.8 for more than six months. So not that high of a rate of serious infections. And these are the reported serious infections in the study. 14 people with pneumonia, 11 urinary tract infections, seven cases of shingles, six cases of appendicitis. Interestingly, they were all perforated, meaning the appendix has burst and pus enters the abdomen. I find that to be strange when I was a medical student. Usually appendicitis wasn't perforated. Maybe this is just a coincidence. Five with sepsis, five with cellulitis, a skin infection, but no instances of PML, again, the brain infection caused by the JC virus. This may seem bad, but I'm not sure if it's that much higher than the general population of people with MS not taking immunotherapy. I found that when the COVID-19 pandemic was bad, there weren't that many people taking Tecfidera getting bad COVID, certainly not compared to drugs like Gelenia or B-cell depleting agents. Other serious reported adverse events, 11 with breast cancer. It may seem like a lot, but with 5,000 people in the study, that's probably comparable to the background rate. Seven with pulmonary embolisms, five with seizures, five with hip fractures, five with heart attacks. Again, I'm not sure this is much different compared to the general population of people with MS or even people without MS not taking this medication. 11 people died or only 0.2%. The article doesn't say exactly how they died. So to summarize what we learned about Tecfidera from this observational study, one, it's fairly common for people to get side effects and stop taking the drug, though they're usually mild and reversible. The rate of lymphopenia or or low lymphocytes is somewhat higher than what we saw in the randomized trials with long-term use, though it's a good sign that it's not clearly strongly linked to an increased risk of infections, maybe because people are just stopping it if their lymphocytes get too low. There certainly are infections associated with this medication, though the rate does not seem to be very high. I believe it to be lower than with drugs such as B-cell depleters. In terms of the efficacy of the drug, it doesn't completely suppress relapses. Some people do have relapses, though the rate is fairly low in people who have been taking it for a while, around 0.1 or one relapse per 10 years on average. If you look at the rate of disability progression, it looks very favorable, probably just as good as higher efficacy agents, though this is an observational study. I'm not sure if I fully believe the results. I do think it's less effective than B-cell depleters, such as Ocrevus, Rituximab, Briumbi, and Casimpta, and Tysabri, and Lintrata, for example. I'd be interested to know if you've taken Tecfidera or similar drugs like Vumerity or Bafiertam. What were your results? Did you have side effects? Did you have relapses? Did you have new MRI lesions? Did you have disability progression? And do you have suggestions for future videos?